Hello and welcome to today's panel discussion on hearing loss. My name is Mike Pervancia and I'm here with Cheryl Blue and we're both deaf and hard of hearing specialists with the Minnesota Department of Human Services uh, with, and with the state of Minnesota. Uh, we provide a variety of services including information and referral as well as uh, direct client assistance, uh, consultation, trainings, uh, equipment labs and demonstration as well as on-site demonstration of that equipment. Um, sign language interpreting referral and CART services referral, as well as the telephone equipment distribution program, the mental health program, and we also administer state grants uh, related to hearing loss as well as deaf blindness. The purpose of today's panel discussion is to raise awareness about hearing loss and the impacts it has on those individuals, and it does vary from person to person. The number of individuals with hearing loss is increasing exponentially amongst the population. One out of five Americans has a hearing loss. That number is 20%. And of those 20%, they consider themselves deaf, have combined vision and hearing loss, or hard of hearing. In addition to their hearing loss, the number one, it is the number one disability amongst veterans. And we are seeing that number increase of those veterans and those soldiers who have come back from combat. The aid, uh, individuals between the ages of 65 and 75, 33% of those individuals have a hearing loss. And individuals above the age of 75, 50% of those individuals experience a hearing loss. So starting with Bob, um, I would like to start by asking uh, the panelists to introduce themselves uh, with their name, the age at which they lost their hearing, how they identify, if at all, as a person with a hearing loss, your type of primary school setting, as well as your mode of communication. Hello, I am Bob Daniels. I was born with severe hearing loss and we call that very hard of hearing. I grew up in a family uh, where everyone used sign language. So with that at home, I was able to go to a public school where I did learn speech and auditory training. So I guess I had the best of both worlds growing up. I did attend a public school through my primary education all the way to sixth grade. Uh, back then, we did not have much support services in the school setting. Uh, once public school was completed, I went to a residential school for the deaf, and that's where I graduated. Hi, my name is Diane Leonard. My, I, my parents realized I was deaf around the age of two. They, I was born deaf. My communication mode is American Sign Language. I use sign language interpreters to voice for me. I went to a residential deaf school for the deaf. I graduated from that school, and that's it. Hi, I'm Mary Bauer, and I um, was born with a hearing loss. I'm considered hard of hearing, and I was identified when I was about four years old. I had an older brother who was profoundly deaf, so my parents were watching, but I had enough hearing that I was responding to different things, so it wasn't until later when they said, mm, we better get our hearing tested. My um, schooling was in public schools. I went to my neighborhood school, and I had support services of speech and language services until I rebelled in high school and then I stopped. Um, I went to um, college, got my degree and have been working ever since. Um, my mode of communication is I like to use my ears as best as I can with my hearing aid to get information and then I like to use my voice to communicate with other people. Hi, I'm Jay Wyatt. I was born deaf. I was not identified as having and hearing loss until I was two years old. For a variety of reasons, the doctor, the specialist, could not identify if that was what the problem was until the conclusion that an audiologist confirmed that I had a hearing loss. Um, I was outfitted with hearing aid that day, the day I was identified, and my parents put me through several different programs at once. There was a school for the deaf, there was an auditory oral school for the deaf. I was, um, they, my parents encouraged 
a laboratory school for kindergarten teacher to put me in their program, even though I was the only deaf person in the school, and they subscribed to a correspondence course called the John Tracy Program in Los Angeles. And then after that, after I was about six years old, I was mainstreamed into the first grade, no support services. There was nothing back then. And went through mainstream and mainstream program until I graduated from high school. Then I went out to college, I got my degree again with no support services until a junior year when they gave me a card that allowed me to make free copies of my print notes. And then I graduated. Uh, and my primary mode is speech. I love my cochlear implant. They're an amazing technology. I got them in my 40s, and they have significantly increased my ability to use sound and rely on sound for listening as well as reading lips. And oh, and one more thing. Um, when I when in meetings, and I'll talk about this more later, I use CART, which is a short an acronym. And the acronym means that you have a stenographer who types like, an, a, lo, like a law clerk, typing in a stenographic machine. And that provides me with very quick, effective mode of understanding what's being said in a group meeting or in a, at a conference. Thank you, panelists. Bob, could you tell us any behaviors or comments from a person who does not have a hearing loss that you have experienced that are frustrating, are demeaning? How would you respond to them? One nice thing about um, being older is you've developed a better sense of humor. But I do remember growing up, uh, there was definitely certain things that people would say that would just chat my hide. It just got me so annoyed having to explain myself multiple times to a variety of people. But as the older I get, I realize that most people just don't get it. And uh, they don't mean to be offensive. And one specific comment that I often get is, Bob, you speak so well. You're so clear. And typically, you know, I say thank you, but what I want to say is you, you don't speak so bad yourself. So obviously that sarcasm isn't good. So I try to be a little bit more gracious than that. So that's one example. Often I'll, people will look at me not as a whole person, but they see as a deaf person with a vision problem. So they only focus on that, on my medical condition instead of me as a human. And I don't want to discuss my medical condition with people. I have other things that I can talk about in my life besides that. Often people say, your intelligence is amazing. And I say, well, you know, the ears and intelligence are not connected. They're two separate functions. And sometimes they help each other and sometimes they don't. One thing that I really have a hard time with is when people, uh, if I'm one-on-one -on -one with someone and they're close enough, I can understand them pretty well if they're speaking clearly enough and using some gestures to support that language. Um, but then after a while, uh, they assume that I don't need an interpreter moving forward. And I say, no, I will decide if I need an interpreter for a certain situation, not you deciding for me. So it's always important to remember that the consumer they know the best what they need for each situation, so let them be the deciding factor. Basically, when people talk to me, I want them to talk to me about different things, about uh, my favorite restaurant, or my favorite books, or where I'd like to travel. I have plenty to talk about instead of just focusing on my hearing loss. People often ask me, this comment all the time is if I'm able to lip read. And to be quite honest, that's my number one pet peeve. Of course I can lip read some, but I'm not perfect at it, but I am asked that all the time. I'm quite fed up with it. Um, you know, if they tell me, oh, I'll tell you later, uh, never mind, never mind, it's not important. Those are things that are quite bothersome to me. And how I often respond to those individuals, it will depend on the situation and the person. You know, if it isn't important, but if I am, if I am in a hurry, uh, I might just let it go and not address the issue. I won't waste my time with it. 
But let's say I'm in a situation where it is quite important and the information is critical to me. I might pull the person right back and forth with them, set up some sort of communication approach so we can find a resolution. And, you know, resolutions might be writing back and forth. Ha you know, smartphones have multiple apps you could use to communicate with another person. You could make a video phone call or use, you know, video relay service to communicate with that individual. It really just might depend on the situation, what I might choose to do. Um, you know, but I, you know, sometimes they don't bother me. I understand they don't often know what they're saying, and it's really a lack of knowledge on their end. And sometimes I just let it go, you know. But those are some things that do get to me from time to time. I agree with what both Diane and Bob have been saying about, I think it's just a lack of awareness that people have um, when they make comments. And I, sometimes if they're uncomfortable, and so they try to fill in. Some of the things that I find, and I'm lucky that I haven't had this one a lot, where people will say, if I say, what did they say? And they go, um, oh, it's not important, or I'll tell you later, or um, it's, you know, it, we'll just wait on that. Um, that that's hurtful and luckily like in my family that never happened but it has happened you know when I've turned to someone and said could you repeat that or um, what would what did you say sometimes that look of like exasperation of like oh. um, and so that's one thing another thing that sometimes happens and I, I take responsibility for this if you say to somebody I'm hard of hearing the Two things that I see happen. One is they start shouting at you. And then another thing is they will over exaggerate how they say the words. And that makes it even harder for me to understand. And so little things like that can happen. Um, I agree with Bob. I want them to see me as a whole person. Uh, I'm not just a pair of ears walking around. Uh, I have lots of interests, lots of things that I like to be involved with or talk about, not just the fact that I have a hearing loss. Uh, I don't mind sharing that in the appropriate situation, but I, that's not all who I am. I'm, I'm more than that. And those are the kind of the top ones that for me, um, again, with the assumptions that I can speech read, it depends on the situation. I might understand 100% of what's being said or I'll understand 0%. So those are just a few of the things that come up as a person that has a hearing loss. Everybody else on this panel has said things that I experienced as well. So it's hard for me to repeat what they say, but I will notice that there are several comments I would like to make. Number one is not, well, I lip read, and I use my ear. I use both of them at the same time. But, I, but because I got my implant at a much older age, I cannot use them perfectly like if I had them when I was a child. So I must lip read to get most information. And like Mary said, that works best when you speak normally. Just relax. Be yourself and speak normally. You do not need to over exaggerate. However, there are people who are always easier to read than others. That's the fact of life. There are also people who may have heavy bears. I can't ask them to shave their bears. That, that's not something you want to do. But you have to recognize sometimes that a little trim would help a little bit. <laughs> However, um, it's not the lift alone that people rely on. We rely on the whole face. We rely on the body. That's how lift really works. And that's how violent concentration works. So what, like Mary and like everybody else has said, when people say, never mind, we're not important, that should be for me to judge. That's not for you to judge. So we are asking you to please repeat, and we will try and not be intuitive about it. Like, have you and ask you every single second. That, of course, we, we don't want to do that. But if it's important, we think it might be important, or if we miss just one word or one phrase, can you just give me that word, that phrase? Maybe I'll start by saying, you said, and then I'll repeat the phrase, and then stop where I left off. All you have to do is add that word then I had everything out because that was the key word that prevented me from understanding the whole conversation. Um, the other thing is, again, you just have to try to relax and try to be normal and try to treat the person you're talking with as the person. They all have, we all have things to share. We all have things to be. 
and we enjoy sharing that with everyone else. Now I do, it's interesting because I have these, this bald head and the very bright implant that I get people saying, what's that? Especially on the bus or on the train, they'll say, what are those things? Is that Bluetooth? Is that a new um, phone? And so all the things to them what it is. And I don't mind doing that because it helps educate people about who I am and educate people about what hearing loss is all about and how powerful and how wonderful these technologies are. So that part, I don't mind because it's often that we just start a conversation. And then you can talk about other, other things as well. Thank you. Um, let's turn to Bob again. What are a few helpful tips or hints that you could provide to a person that doesn't have a hearing loss on how to communicate with you better? Not only am I deaf, but I also have vision problems as well. So that started uh, in the last couple years for me. With my vision problems, I have limited vision. So I need for people to understand that lighting is very important in a room for me. And in making sure that the light isn't directly aimed at my face. And also be careful of like low lighting, like during dawn or during dusk time. I have a hard time often seeing those um, and communicating during that because I already struggle to be able to see. So it's kind of a double burden as well, adding the hearing loss on top of that. So I appreciate when people share that responsibility instead of saying, you figure out the lighting, that's your issue, instead of coming to the table as an ally. Um, getting my intention, the best ways to do that is um, tapping me, not waving your hands in front of my face. So tapping my shoulder, my elbow, my forearm the, in that region. And then I know that you're there and a very gentle tap, mind you, not a slap. Um, so just a little tap. And then I know that you are here in space and then I can move my vision to your area, my field of vision and then I have to get you in focus. I can't just look around and track a conversation visually so it takes me a moment to find where people are in space so giving me that time to do that. Now this is both for deaf and hearing people that sign. If you use sign language please make sure it's clear, finger spelling clearly for everyone who's also learning or using the sign language. So making sure that clarity of language is important. Otherwise, I will struggle to understand exactly what you're trying to get at. And that doesn't go with just the signing production, but also if the message is clear or not. You can write back and forth. That's a great strategy. Um, Unfortunately, today, people, their writing isn't very clear, so writing in block, all capital letters, is very helpful instead of like a cursive or a flowy writing. Please don't keep ask if I, under please stop asking if, do you understand me? Do you understand me? If I don't understand you, I will let you know, or my face will show you if I'm a little bit quick to the side or trying to lean in, you'll know there's something I'm missing. So read my reactions more than constantly asking for me to validate if I understand or not. When I'm using an interpreter like I am right now, um, now the camera can't see them, they're off of sight line, but I do have interpreters here in front of me and there's an interpreter who is deaf and she, every time somebody is signing something she's copy signing that so that I have access to that. In other situations I might have interpreters with me such as in a doctor's appointment or a variety of different locations and often the hearing person isn't comfortable with me even though they think I'm nice and friendly but they typically refer to the interpreter to have chit-chatty conversations and a good professional interpreter will deflect that conversation back to me so that I can build that relationship with the provider and often I know that those situations are awkward so I ask that when you see an interpreter there with me you can acknowledge the interpreter shake their hand but then the whole conversation is directly between us the interpreter is there to support our conversation You know, communication is a two-way street. Not all the burden should be on me to make sure that communication is effective. We both should work together, and we both could strategize how to communicate better together. And so you as a hearing person could ask me, or ask a person with a hearing loss, what would work better for you to communicate better or most effectively and versus deciding for me. 
So I grew up deaf. I know quite well what works for me and what doesn't and versus you knowing best for me and deciding for me. Um, I may want to write back and forth. I may want to use an interpreter. Like Bob mentioned before, there's a variety of ways to communicate with, with a person and in addition with working with a deaf person. Um, it, for me, it's important to get my attention, tap my shoulder so I can find who's wanting to communicate with me. Um, you know, sometimes it's natural for you to yell, and if I don't acknowledge you, just be aware that I, I have a hearing loss. Um, you may assume I'm ignoring you, but it just might be the simple fact I don't hear you yelling, yelling towards my direction. Um, be very mindful of background lighting. Um, so if you sit in front of a window, I can't see your face. Your face is darkened and I can't see you. So be aware of background light. And so we can work together to, to set up a, a better system. Maybe we can move to a different location so communication be more effective. And I hope that the hearing person working with me will want to work with me and want to be um, open to the information that I have. Um, just know that it's a, it's a two-way street. We both have an obligation to make sure that communication is effective for, for each other. As a hard of hearing person, I do like to rely on my ears to get information. So background noise is a huge issue for me. And I also like to supplement my auditory with what I can see. So having, being able to see someone's face is very helpful. I think that's a pretty generic thing for most people who are hard of hearing. It's the, their awareness of background noise and um, your soothing sound is a noise to me. So I always tell people, if people say, oh, let's go take a little walk by the babbling brook. And I'm saying inside myself, oh, let's not. Because that, even that's a soothing sound, even though it is, it is not for me because it's competing for the speech sound. So I think awareness of background sound. I have family and friends well trained. The moment I step in a vehicle, they turn off the background noises, um, which would, they would call it a radio. I call it background noise. And so that's very, very important for me to get the um, information. Now, it, it's impossible when you're at a party or we're in a big group, you know, then I have some tools that I have in my little toolbox that I pull out and I can use to do that. Um, I'm, I think another thing, a lot of people, and I've heard this from Bob and Diane, and I'm guessing Jay is going to talk about it too, is that uh, please don't feel you have to take care of me. Uh, I, I don't need to be taken care of. I like to be, um, when people are thoughtful and considerate, but I don't want people to say, oh, Stand over here, it'll be easier to hear. If I'm not having a problem, I'll, I have, you know, coping strategies. So th that's one of the big things for me is that background sound, the noises and things. I was just on a conversation with a woman yesterday on her phone. She had a hearing loss, so she had her TV blaring, and I was really struggling because she also had an accent. And so I had to ask her, could you please turn down the TV or turn it off. I'm really having a hard time understanding you. And then we worked it out and you know worked through it. So there are a lot of skills that those of us who were born with a hearing loss that have. I think this changes since the majority of people who are hard of hearing, it's usually later in their life. So they haven't had a long time to practice these skills. And so sometimes they won't ask the same things that someone like myself who's had this all their life. So there, there's lots of things that um, can help and hinder. And I, for me, the two big things is the background noise and then being able to see you. And like Diane mentioned and Bob, the lighting and everything is important. Mary made a very good point in that being born there, I learned how to be a self African at a very early age. So I, it's up to me in many cases to inform you if I need something different. For example, if you're talking like this, I can ask them, please move your hand from your mouth, and they, oh, no problem. So most people are very obliging when I make a specific request, such as the hand from the mouth, or if I say, do you mind if I sit over there by the window? so I can make sure that my back is to the window and everybody else is facing the light. That's their problem. I want to sit by the window and see all of you, and most people are very fine with that as long as they make that request. Uh, but I can imagine that if you get hearing loss later in life, you may not be as aware of how to make those requests or why you need to make those requests. And so that's where both sides communicating can make it a bit different. 
people act. It's located by sit here rather than you sit there. So in other words, think about people who may be struggling, maybe trying to figure out how, how do I need, get what I need? How do I ask for one? How do I get it? So that's a very important point that Mary made. I uh, mentioned um, line of sight. That line of I had great peripheral vision. I still need line of sight. I still need to receive what's going on. So especially in a group conversation, one of the biggest challenges for me and for anyone who relies on sight to understand what's going on is having that pause between one person saying something and the next person saying something. When I'm with a group of deaf friends and we're all talking, it's a very different kind of conversation that you might see when people who are all hearing with a deaf friend. First, this person talk. When the person is done, and that somebody wants to respond, that person usually does something visual. I'm talking, or make a move to show that we know, oh, this person is talking, and we get to see who's talking. It's still a spontaneous conversation. It's still free flowing, but there's enough visual awareness in there that people know, people have time to catch up. And if somebody's confused, we're always quick to, to help that person understand what word they meant, what phrase they meant, what they're talking about. The other thing is sometimes when I join in a conversation, sometimes it's helpful to say, hey Jay, we're talking about the Viking game last night. So I get a clue as to what the concept is all about by giving me contact. I could then say, oh, I, yeah, that cat was phenomenal. And I can jump in and I can become part of the conversation. I can also have some contact again on try to pick out what they are saying because I'm pulling out from my dictionary. What could those words mean? What could those root sounds be? Um, so, so line of sight is very important. Um, communicating, be aware that they may or may not need something, but, but instead of making assumptions about the person, ask them, can I, do I, should I? And kind of leave it, leave it to them to respond to you in that way. So because it is a two-way street. Um, and the other key thing is also, I think I said it earlier, speak normally. Talk normally and talk with the person who is there rather than the interpreter or someone else. You be aware of that. Um, can you tell us what challenges and issues a person with your type of hearing loss uh, experiences on a day to day basis? Every day there's always old challenges that I experience and then also some new ones that take me by surprise. Uh, for me, it's talking about the closed captioning on programs. Uh, not always do they have great captions on captioned items. So sometimes that causes some frustrations when the information is not correct um, because that's the same problem that you see historically. And a person at Starbucks always struggles to understand what I'm saying, and I order the same drink every day. So those are kind of some things that I experience every day. Um, but it's, I just learned to smile over time and be pleasant and work together with someone to mediate those interactions. Um, some of the challenges that I've had more recently is because of my vision loss. Um, I've been blind in one eye for many years, um, but just this past fall, I lost the vision in my other eye, and that kind of happened immediately. And that was a, uh, the retina detached, and I had no tools to navigate that new normal for me. So I was dependent on um, the kindness of my family and friends. I asked uh, friends to read my mail to me that had been sent to me. I had no mobility skills ingrained yet and I had no sense of orientation in space. I didn't know Braille. Um, so really that overnight experience was a, a huge challenge for me and it caused a lot of frustration, caused depression, and I would say anger. I was very angry at myself, also at God, but that process is something that I've been working through and the process to this day, I've been just preparing myself to recognize now, even though I've had surgery, which has helped some of the vision recover some of it, um, but it's still not a stable sight. So one day I might lose my vision again. And so my challenge now is, am I prepared for when that happens? Am I doing my own homework to get the training that is necessary so I can take advantages of the services here in the state of Minnesota? And I can say now that the answer is yes, but that took me a long time to get to that answer. And so... I should be prepared for the next time. 
for deaf, deaf, blind, or hard of individuals, um, you know, I've been sighted all of my life, or excuse me, I've been, what I've seen all of my life is the loss of opportunity, the availability for people in general with hearing loss. And it could be a lack of knowledge or awareness of what deaf or hard of hearing people need. Um, and so it's been, I have been frustrated by that experience. And also understanding what the accommodations that they may need. You know, many people with hearing and vision loss want to work. They have been on a hunt for a job for, for quite some time. But many things that they have this attitude like the people, the hiring body is saying that they can't. They can't do this. They can't do that. And so that's quite, um, uh, it's a morale boost. Or it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's difficult to work through that process because it's so overwhelming. And, you know, sometimes deaf people feel as though they're a burden on hearing people. Um, you know, we would like them to, to come to us to say, what can we do for you? Uh, do you need interpreting services? Do you need some, some sort of other accommodation? It, just so that we feel as though we're cared about. We are working amongst them, alongside them. I'd like to see that more and more. Obviously, some are more motivated to hire people with hearing loss, but not, others not so much. So the Americans with Disabilities Act, when that law has passed, you know, it's come a long way. I mean, thing, not everything is resolved because of the ADA. Um, I know it's 2017, but we still have some barriers. We still have a long fight ahead of us. There are many deaf and hard of hearing, deaf blind people that I want them to be sort of integrated into the communities and see that more and more. I want to see that sooner than later. Our culture is becoming more diverse. And with diversity comes um, people from different lands, which brings accents. So for me personally, the biggest challenge in the last few years is being able to understand people better with accents. And I have to say, I am getting better, but it really helps when um, people use what I call clear speech. And basically, clear speech is enunciating. And if people slow down and pronounce the entire word, doesn't matter the accent, I do much better. So I think that's very helpful. Now I'm going to make it more generic to the group of people who are hard of hearing. Uh, I, in my day-to-day -day work, I work with people who are experiencing hearing loss. And for some people, it slow and gradual for others is quick and overnight kind of like what Bob was talking about and all the emotions that come with that all the things that were easy to do before as in terms of communication those kind of walk by you know hi how you doing what did you do last night with coworkers becomes more laborious so a lot of people feel like their relationships change on a personal level at work and that's really hard. I think some of the hardest things that I've had to hear people say is, I remember one gentleman saying, I now know who my real friends are, because he experienced a hearing loss, and there were just some friends that just couldn't, couldn't accept the new him and the new communication thing that they were going to have to adapt to if they wanted to keep a relationship with him with him and so that was very hurtful to him um, and then I see a lot of people who are fighting isolation they know if they don't get hearing aid or get some kind of help listening do they're they're losing their relationship so they're staying in their house they're not going to things that they used to love they used to love going to the theater so they don't do that and I think for a lot of people coming into hearing loss they don't realize the technology that's available not just the things that you use for hearing and hearing and communicating but also the things that can keep them safe at home so there's a lot of anxiety about oh I'm not going to be able to hear the fire alarm or what if the baby cries at night you know and I'm responsible for my grandchild those kinds of things so I see a lot of those social emotional things that occur when hearing loss comes in at a later date and there's a lot of having to adapt to new things um, new strategies and things like that so I think that those are some big issues for people. Well, I'm talking about hearing loss 
communication is intentional. There is very little indirect communication unless you are among a group of peers. When you are a person with a hearing loss in a group of people with what you call, might call normal hearing, communication is intentional. And that can be very different than how people with hearing perceive communication. When you are at work or when you are on the school ground, most communication is incidental. You're hearing other people have conversations. You're hearing somebody else on the phone with someone else. You're not snooping, but you're accumulating that information. We're not saying we want to snoop, but we are saying that you have to recognize that a lot of your information, where the next party is, why there's an emergency happening, or what might be happening next week, all of that is something that you pick up. And you don't make that intentional communication with someone with a hearing loss. Many, ways, they're, many times they're going to be excluded. And so you may have to forget the, hearing, the person with the hearing loss to say, excuse me, what are you talking about? Or, excuse me, is there something I need to know? Or, why is everybody doing something? Understand that when the person is asking about that, they may be anxious, frustrated, confused, because they're not getting that intentional communication that they need. So you have to recognize that. You have to recognize that sometimes the request or even the demand from the person with the hearing loss is not because they're mad at you. It's because they're trying to deal with the situation. And that's going to happen in all levels of life. So for example, when I, was, when I was a child with a hearing loss, all of my communication was based on what the teacher said or what a friend said. Nothing, and what I saw from visual cues people's manners and people's behavior. That was it. So all the shit chat, all the shadow, all the phone conversations, I got none of that. And that's where everybody else gets most of their communication. So you have to recognize that and how that impacts you. So for a child with a hearing loss, very often you may have to find ways to provide that child with social and emotional and um, behavior skills. So you may have to spend more time with that child helping develop their social and emotional skills because most people gather those skills by osmosis. For the person with the hearing loss, you're going to have to focus on those skills because they're going to have to build those skills and learn how to intentionally use those skills in their communication. So I spoke about the child. Well, the same too for an older person who loses hearing. Because when an older person who loses hearing, suddenly their field of awareness is limited. And that can impact their emotional well-being, just like what Bob and Diane and Mary, and Mary talked about. So again, maybe they need to think about counseling. Maybe, I'm not, that's not your decision, that's their decision. But you have to think about that and be aware of how can they build those skills. Um, and then, so the norm of social behavior is a norm that's developed by the hearing world. And Sometimes the person with the hearing loss may appear not to fit that norm. That's okay. That's their job. That's what that they are behaving. What, what, that's for them. So, um, and then I'll talk a little more later about the logistics of providing support services and costs and things like that. That was something I'll talk about in a few minutes. Thank you, Jay. Um, Bob, could you tell us uh, what improvements that you've seen? over the recent years in the removal of barriers in accessing your community settings? There's been a lot of improvements in services over the years, including technology. But I will tell you that a lot of the improvements are things that we have fought for in the community. So almost nothing was just automatically given to us. We fought for all the improvements that we see now, both technology and services. Um, a lot of technology has been invented because of different, um, the market demand in our community itself. So for example, video communication technologies, including FaceTime, video relay services, uh, new hearing aids, Bluetooth technology. Some people benefit from cochlear implants. There's a lot of technology that's available. And for people with vision loss as well, there's a lot of new technologies in the, in the community. Um, there's 
text readers that then can translate text into speech. Uh, there's active braille displays. There's more and more technologies available. For services, for people such as myself, uh, Minnesota is one of the top states in the services that they provide for Minnesotans. Minnesota is a culture of awareness um, for people that are deaf and blind or have limited vision, and I really appreciate the services that the state of Minnesota provides. We get a lot of services here. And also Minnesota has deaf-blind services as well, and they have a variety of supports that they provide and services within that state agency as well. I'm grateful for uh, better alerting systems, um, such as the flashing lights that I can add into my house or vibrations that can be synced with my clock so I never miss any appointments I need to go to. Uh, whether I go to any kind of medical appointment, there's always an interpreter that's provided there and I'm just always a little bit shocked by that. I don't even have to ask. I don't even have to add that into my daily to-do list. They're just there. It's a right and a privilege that we have and Minnesota recognizes that and for that uh, has made my life much easier. Not the easiest that it could be, but easier. Well, Bob, you know, I, I just could reiterate everything that he's just said. So video communication, video relay service, um, smartphones. I can just pull up my smartphone and have a signing conversation over the airwaves. Um, just like Skype, FaceTime. And there are a variety of video relay service softwares that you can download onto your phone. You can use point-to-point -point communication. And so all of those video communications are available right there on your phone or your personal device. And that's a huge improvement for my day-to-day -day life. And so just that type of, you know, we used to use the old typewriter um, or, you know, landline phones, and those are going out and becoming obsolete. And so we're having these mobile devices so we have access to communication all the time. Um, and so a lot of this is very beneficial to deaf people. So employers who hire deaf people, they can use those technologies and those equipments to help, uh, you know, modify the work environment to make sure that communication is effective and successful. And they can maintain and have a longer beneficial employment experience with that consumer. You know, I think about where we'll be five to ten years from now with technology advances. I mean, it changes so quickly, and sometimes you're, you know, you fight to keep up with the, the most, latest and greatest, and I'm sure some the future panelists will talk about that too, but I think we still have a long way to go, but like what Bob said, um, I really do what, like the points that he did make. There are a variety of resources available to people for deaf, hard of hearing services and providers out there. And take advantage of those services and to help you cope with that hearing loss a little bit better. And there are, like I said, a variety of services to help you deal with those situations. Well, being a hard of hearing person, I have to talk about hearing aids and the change and the improvement in, in that arena, but I'm going to get one of the myths squashed right away. The myth is, is you get a pair of hearing aids and oh my goodness you have 20-20 hearing. You do not. But hearing aid technology has advanced tremendously. I always tell people, I, I mean I, had, I got my hearing aid probably not as quick as Jay did that day of, but very soon after it was identified that I had a hearing loss, I got my hearing aid and um, it was what I would call, it was a, a field horse hearing aid, meaning it, it did its job, it plodded along, it, it made the sound louder, um, didn't make things clearer, but it got me through school. And then within the last, I would say, 15 years, the technology really started changing. And so for me, the hearing technology, the only way I can describe some things is I didn't realize, like when you vacuum, that there were different layers of sound. I, it was just one big roar to me with my old technology. With the new hearing aids, it's like, oh my gosh, there's different levels of sound, different, um, you know, high, low, medium sound, and 
um, I can actually hear when I click into something metal that I shouldn't be vacuuming up, I guess. And so that's amazing to me. Another technology is being able to understand when I go to a restaurant or an, even in a noisy environment, I can push a button on my hearing aids, and now hearing aids have different programs, which means they're set up for specific listening environment. And so I can go to a restaurant and actually hear what the person is saying across the table, where before it was a lot of lip reading, a lot of, you know, intense um, work in getting the information. Now I can relax a little bit more in those noisier environments. So for me, the hearing aid technology has been an amazing advancement. Again, it doesn't make it perfect, but oh my goodness, um, it has made a big difference being able to differentiate different sounds. Um, I will say with uh, what Diane and Bob, and I know Jay is going to talk about too, is that access with visual communication, um, captioning, we need to get them more in bigger public places. I think, I know they're working at the airport and those kind of public venues, but there's a lot of voids in big places where if there are announcements, you have no idea what's being said over the PA system because it's, I actually, frankly, am amazed that people that have no hearing loss can understand what's being said. But, you know, so we, we've got some things as far as visual communication that we can improve out, especially in public places. And some of our captioning um, sources on TV are, need to be worked on, but we've come a long way. Uh, I am, I, I'm in love with the speech-to-text apps that people can use, so um, when somebody is saying something and I'm struggling, understanding if they have a smartphone or I have a smartphone, they just pull it out and it it does a pretty good job of, of translating from speech to text, which had then moved the, the technology for caption phone, where people actually can hear the person talking, but they also can read um, what's being said. That's not technology in the phone yet. That's a live person that's providing those captions. But I think, I think we're at the cusp of where that can be built in to phones and things like that. So, it's amazing where the technology had taken us, and I'm excited to see where it's going to go in the future. What Mary said about hearing aid is true for me as well, but with the cochlear implant. Now, I grew up with a hearing aid all my life, just like Mary did. And just like Mary, I had the big body aid when I started, the plodding hearing aid, then I got behind the ear and all that. But with the behind the ear hearing aid, because I, I'm deaf, I had to get the most powerful, bigger behind the ear hearing aid and I had to turn them up all the way. And it relied on the ear mold to put everything in there. And that made it sometimes it squeal. It had feedback. So my friends would know I was coming because they could hear me walking up to them because my ears were squealing. That also limited what I could hear. Now with a cochlear implant, which I did not get until my 40s, that squealing is gone because it's electronically wired to my brain, so to speak. It's amazing technology. Not only that, hearing aids only use what we call residual hearing. They can use only what you have and then try to black that up, flat that up so you get a little more. That's what hearing aids do. And like Mary said, they do it very, very well. Well, with the cochlear implant, I get all the sound. I get low, medium, and high frequency, all of it, because it goes right into my brain, so to speak. I know a doctor would, would cream that that, but that's the reality of it. And I have no squealing, I have all the sound, and I can use the sound as much as my brain can handle. So well, that's wonderful, wonderful, it's amazing technology. But like Mary, you get a coconut implant, you're not hearing. You have to learn how to use that sound. Your brain has to rewire itself to learn how to use that information. So that's true whether you are given the implant when you're a child or when you're an older person. You still have to learn. So now speaking of learning, uh, Bob, Diane, and Mary all talked about the new technology that are out there and the better use of technology like captioning. It's so much more wonderful that captioning is now becoming more of a mainstream thing. I go into a restaurant or a bar and the captain is already there. I don't have to pester the bartender for it. You usually had to have arguments with the bartender by turning it on or they didn't know how to turn it on or it was set so that you could not turn it on. Now, because of the ADA and because of awareness and because of the fact that people can't hear the television in a bar, they had the captain on and that is wonderful. But now we have to move to the next level, like what Mary said. Figuring out how to make that work on videos on YouTube, for example. 
YouTube has done a wonderful job at making it easy to caption video. You don't have to do it. And automated captions don't work. You can create a video, you can make automated captions. It's nice, but it's not wonderful. You have to put some effort into it. And so that's where we have to get to socializing. How to make this work for everyone. Because, believe it or not, most people who use technologies like captioning or visual alerts or other things aren't deaf people. They're all of you. Everybody using those two things. Okay? Imagine you are in bed with your spouse and you want to watch the program and your spouse wants to go to sleep. Turn on the caption. You're watching the TV. So you think about the fact that getting awareness of all these things and not just because we're fighting it for, for ourselves will help you understand that, you know what? It benefits everyone. And there's a lot more things I can talk about than that. But that's pretty much um, what I want to end with. Although I do want to note that uh, Minnesota advocates have done a wonderful job of removing legal and financial barriers. Um, a lot, now a lot of the barriers are often logistical. Uh, Bob talked about the fact that he had interpreters there for him without having to ask for it at the medical facility. But sometimes that's not always the case. A range of those logistics can be very time consuming and very frustrating. You don't know what's exactly what you're doing. So one of the challenges is awareness. You can have a hearing loss. What do you need? What kind of tools are out there? How do you throw tools? There's a lot of training and awareness that needs to take place, and everybody needs to help push in to make that happen. You know, I've been reading more and hearing more about um, age-related hearing loss and some of its consequences. Uh, Mary, could you tell us more about that and where we could get uh, help for those uh, seniors included uh, for, for such things? Absolutely, Mike. Thanks. Um, you know something has become more mainstream when it has its own acronym. So A-R-H-L, age-related hearing loss, has its own little initial. So it is becoming more and more in the news. Uh, people are looking for information. There's been research being done talking about untreated hearing loss. And the consequences of that are not just that a person misses a few things. They're linking it to possibly to increase um, risk of getting dementia. They're also tying it to increased fall, more repeated hospitalization. Um, one of the things probably people have noticed um, with age-related hearing loss, if it's untreated, is isolation. Isolation to depression um, is not a big uh, leap for there. So there there are more and more um, things available for people. There was a TPT with the Minnesota Commission for Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing people developed a um, half hour show called Hearing Loss Matters. So if you just go to hearinglossmatters.org, there's lots of information with lots of resources. Another issue that comes up with age-related hearing loss is when they find out the consequences of untreated hearing loss is the cost of hearing aids. There are things happening at the national level. Uh, so we might be seeing what they're calling over-the-counter hearing aids that are going to be at a greatly reduced price. So there are a lot of things happening. Uh, for more information about that, there's a wonderful national organization called Hearing Loss Association of America. And then they also have some local chapters. We've got, I think, about three of them in Minnesota. So if you want to find a local chapter, you can click on that and link to a local Hearing Loss Association of America um, group that might have more information or some supportive group meetings and things like that. So there's, there's lots happening. I think we're going to see more and more resources. Deaf and Hard of Hearing Services is obviously a great referral, not only for age-related hearing loss, but for um, the dual vision hearing loss issues. We've got a family member who is deaf. We're a great resource for people. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, panelists, for your involvement and in sharing your perspectives about the world of hearing loss. And thank you, your very, the viewing audience, for listening and tuning in today. We really hope and sincerely encourage you to continue to improve your knowledge and understanding of hearing loss. For more information, please visit the website.
Thank you so much.